So we actually have Neil Chilson from uh, the FTC, and then we have Kara Van Stralen from Booker, from Cory Booker's office, and Jamie Suskin from Senator Deb Fisher's office. So uh, I think we're going to talk more about the policy side of this right now um, to begin with. And I know um, both of your offices are working on a bipartisan effort to create uh, a national resolution or national strategy for the Internet of Things. Um, so I want to talk to you guys about why that's important. Why do you need to have a strategy for the Internet of Things? Is it really just so that uh, the commercial sector, the tech, tech companies can they know that, uh, you know, Congress knows what the Internet of Things is or is, is there a broader goal here? I'll, uh, I'll start us off, I guess, a little background on our legislation. It's called the Digit Act, which I cannot take credit for uh, the name. That was all Jamie. <laughs> um, but uh, basically, our offices, along with uh, two other offices, Senator Schatz and um, Ayotte, um, we... Uh, yes, and Erica's here uh, from Senator Ayotte's <laughs> office also. But um, we kind of started exploring this topic about a year and a half or so ago and just took the opportunity to sort of hear from as many tech experts. We literally were like, anybody who is willing to talk to us, please come and let's discuss the IoT. So we had kind of a year-long uh, exploration of this issue. And the one thing that we just kept hearing over and over again from small companies and huge companies was um, sort of a lack of coordination with the agencies. And we wanted to work on a project that would kind of get everybody in the same room and get agencies not only coordinating with each other, sort of breaking these silos, but also um, with industry and, and having everybody sort of collaborate and work together. So our legislation creates a working group that uh, would allow for that exact process and um, so that's kind of where we are coming from on that and I don't know if you want to yeah. talk about the spectrum piece too. So our bill as Kara said would create a working group that consists of both private sector and public sector entities because I think key to us is that they actually are having the conversation you know um, I think we recognize that the private sector is doing great stuff and the public sector is doing great stuff but if they're not communicating then that's not helpful for any of us. Um, also, you know, another important piece for IoT is spectrum, and that's what we've heard from a lot of folks. Um, the Senate recently marked up a spectrum bill. Um, you know, we're pretty happy with that, I think. So we also, in our bill, asked the FCC to just kind of look at, um, you know, where spectrum stands for IoT right now and kind of what companies might need, what we need on a national level to kind of develop IoT. Um, and I guess I would also sort of just add to what Kara had said. Um, I think people sometimes get a little bit nervous when they hear, you know, Congress is looking into this. They kind of say, you know, why does Congress need to look into this? You know, everyone's doing a great job. And I think we would agree. Um, but, you know, uh, like I said, if the dialogue is not happening, we just kind of want to make sure that we're doing everything that we can to foster an environment of competitiveness and growth and to make sure that the U.S. can actually lead on this. Um, our intent was certainly not to be heavy-handed in this at all. It's mostly to just facilitate the conversation to make sure that everybody is kind of on the same page and, you know, kind of shares the same goals going forward. So are you, in both of your jobs, are you talking about the government as a potential customer of the Internet of Things, or are you more concerned about the regulation of the Internet of Things for consumers? I think our primary uh, area of interest was looking at government as the regulator, um, but we certainly uh, you know, both of our bosses certainly are huge fans of any way that we can incorporate uh, IoT into government operations. I'll say the Senate is severely behind in, in that. I mean, we don't even have public Wi-Fi in the Senate, if that gives you any idea of just how far behind we are. So we're definitely interested in that as well. And I will say from my own experience, I came from an agency before I came to the Senate. I won't name them. If you Google me or whatever, you can probably find it. Um, they were also very behind, and that was bad given that their mission involved technology. Um, so I think that the IoT definitely has the potential to kind of revolutionize how government works to make it more efficient and sort of make them, you know, better for the users that they serve, you know, all of us in the public interest. So. Um, you know, like from healthcare to VA, I think that they just kind of have that opportunity. So we feel like, you know, our working group in the bill would actually look at both. So I think both are important. Yeah, and within that, um, and Neil, maybe you have some insight on, on this. Where do you think the greatest opportunity is for the government as a customer? I know um, a while ago I wrote about GSA's uh, headquarters downtown where they, they have this like smart office lab where they have 
uh, motion sensing desks and lamps and, and um, you know, window shades that respond to the sunlight outside and it seems very high tech, but I'm wondering, you know, at, if the government is to be a customer of the Internet of Things, where do you see the market opportunity? Well, as I, I work at the Federal Trade Commission and our mission is, uh, one of our missions is to protect consumers. So generally when we think about the Internet of Things, we're thinking about consumers buying it and uh, the effects that uh, new technology have on consumers. Um, but the Internet of Things is, uh, as was mentioned on the previous panel, such a broad area of innovation. It's kind of like saying, how could the government uh, benefit from microchips? And like, how could the government benefit from electricity, right? There's, there's, if you're early on in, in a, a revolutionary technology, it's really hard to know what the applications are gonna be. And I think industry is still figuring those out, but, but all of the benefits of, uh, towards logistics and communications that industry is exploring right now, the government does a lot of those same things. Um, and uh, judging from past experience, uh, it will take some time for that to get into the government, but, um, but I think the government, uh, to the extent it, it, it does some of these same functions, will have to adopt um, IoT and, and will, the same way it's adopted email and internet, generally. So. Although, judging on it's spotty sometimes, <laughs> judging from my own experience. Right. <laughs> so uh, I wanted to ask you, Neil, about a report uh, that the F FTC had put out about uh, p the potential risks of big data, right? So I think the title of the report was Big Data, a Tool for Inclusion or Exclusion. And one of the arguments in that report is um, potentially as, as companies are starting to harvest lots of data about a general population, a particular individual might be lumped in for the wrong reasons into a, you know, a category of people based on one element of their lifestyle. So uh, for instance, someone's credit score could potentially be affected because they shop at the same stores that someone else who has a lower credit score has. So as uh, companies start to gather more information from more different possible sources, different devices, different, you know, different sensors everywhere in their workplace, in their home, how could that potentially affect the consumer in a way that we didn't anticipate? Before we get to the negative, I think the big data report generally found that uh, big data has enormous benefits for consumer, very likely to be enormous benefits for consumers. Um, and when we think about how companies would use data, one of the big problems they're trying to solve when they're gathering data is to be more accurate when they're when they understand people. So a lot of, so we hear kind of two different fears about big data and how it might be misused. We first hear the sort of, I might be miscategorized. Um, I might be put into a category that I'm actually not in. Now, uh, from a kind of a, an economics point of view, we look at incentives that companies have. Companies have every incentive to put you in the right categories. That doesn't mean they'll get it right every time, right? But, but generally, we don't wanna get in the way of a market where the incentives are proper. The other type of problem that we hear is that, well, it will be too accurate, right? That they'll know too much about me. And, uh, and that problem raises some other issues. Uh, that, has, that has issues about, you talked about credit scoring. Um, credit scoring is a really interesting market in part because the people who are most hurt by credit scores are people who can't, who have what they call thin files, people who don't have a credit score people who can't get credit because nobody knows anything about them. And so, uh, and so a lot of these big data techniques are starting to build profiles for people who otherwise could not have credit at all. And so, um, so there's some issues surrounding credit scores and we've had a law since the 1970s called the Fair Credit Reporting Act, which you could consider the first big data law passed in the 1970s that says credit scores can only be used in certain ways and for on, only for certain things. And, uh, and the, FCC, uh, the FTC is one of the agencies that enforces that law. And, um, and I think that's kind of the approach we need to think about when we think about harms, possible harms from data, is to focus on the kinds of uses as a society that we think uh, that, that nobody wants to have. And then we can think about, on top of that, letting people choose the uses that match their risk profile or their personal preferences about privacy. And so that's kind of how the FTC looks at it in its, in its uh, privacy um, uh, enforcement actions overall. And I, I think it's a good way to think about uh, the big data uh, problem more generally. 
So how much responsibility in, in the FTC's framework does the consumer have to actually figure out what data is being collected about themselves and make sure it's accurate and make sure that they actually want it to be collected? So, so that's great. That's a great question. Uh, we, the obligations on companies under the, uh, the uh, FTC's privacy uh, regulations are first, if you say something, it has to be true. And what we've seen is over time that, that companies, if you look at it now, if all they were worried about was getting sued by the FTC, nobody would have a privacy policy, right? They, would, they wouldn't make any promises to consumers about what they did with data. What we've seen is that the market actually pushes companies. Consumers want to know in the broad details what people are doing with their data. Um, privacy policies can be really dense and they're not always effective at communicating that, but there are lots of groups out there who, I, I know every time Facebook changes its privacy policy, uh, lots of people let me know, so I don't have to read it myself. So, um, so there's lots of groups out there who have an interest in digging into those details and, and can uh, get that information out. So privacy policies serve a good job of transparency. As far as what consumers are obligated to do or where we would let companies off the hook, uh, off the hook is the wrong, the wrong, kind of the wrong way to put it. Companies have to tell the truth to their consumers. If they say one thing and they do something else, uh, they can be liable. Uh, and then at a baseline, if they do things uh, that are unfair, under our, that's one of our, our legal standards is unfairness, uh, where the, the benefits uh, of the practice uh, are, the cost of the practice are outweighed by, are outweigh the benefits, and uh, there's a substantial harm to consumers that they can't avoid, um, then, so that's a baseline of practices, and that kind of gets back to the privacy practices I was talking about before, the kind of use-based practices. You can't use credit reports, um, you know, to, to decide whether or not to hire somebody. That sort of thing, where we said, we've just said straight up, this use is not fair. Um, and we've said that kind of as a society, either through Congress or through, uh, you know, uh, a, a Rule uh, cases over time that show us that those that consumers uh, don't benefit from that. Um, uh, so, I'm not sure I answered your question. Consumers don't have an obligation other than their obligation to to uh, make the choices that they think are in their interest, and companies have to respect those choices when they make it. Sure. So it seems like all of you are, are thinking about this from more of a, a consumer perspective. So I'm wondering um, from from an education perspective, what kinds of things do you think consumers still need to know? Um, as more and more things are getting connected, um, you know, do you have any tips for consumers uh, how to protect themselves or how to make sure that their information isn't? <laughs> so, um, yeah, we have, so, we have a lot of tips for consumers about privacy practices generally and about data security. Um, we also have a lot of educational materials for small businesses um, and we have a new program called Start With Security that lays out 10, 20, 10 or 20 lessons from our case law about what, what, um, what are proper data security practices. Um, some of those tips, uh, you know, you and I would never do, like don't open attachments from people you don't know. Um, but some of them are, are more detailed uh, about, uh, in the, especially in the business sphere, about like, you know, design, design security in, design privacy in. Um, think about those up front because it's really hard to retrofit them in later. Um, as far as Internet of Things specific, our, our you know, our report um, that we did in 2014, the main concern that, was that, that we heard about from all the participants in that was uh, security. And, one of the problems there, um, thinking of it from an economics perspective, is very much an uh, incentives problem. If you have a small light bulb, um, updating the security in that light bulb may not make a ton of sense from a, from a business point of view, and so you could have out-of-dated devices. Now, the truth is that that light bulb is really only useful if it's in a smart home system, and that smart home system could, the company that has that smart home system has every incentive probably to make sure that the light bulb is updated or the consumer is aware that it's not, so. What's it like when you're briefing the Congress, the Congress people? Are they really getting this stuff? Like, how, and how deep in the weeds do you guys get? Because I'm always curious when I go to these hearings and I hear people talk, most of them don't really sound like they know what they're talking about past talking points. But you guys do, so I want to 
what, what's that interaction like? Well, uh, this just made me think of earlier this morning when I was trying to fix our printer in my office, and I'm like, <laughs> I don't get this technology, you know, I just regulate it, no. But um, I'd say uh, both of our bosses are pretty pretty savvy on this stuff. My boss, if anyone follows him on Twitter, uh, <laughs> Snapchat now is his new thing. Does he do um, all his own tweeting? I wonder that. I'd say 90% or so, most of it, yeah. Um, uh, my boss is a huge tech Fan. He would love to be here with all of us nerds talking about this this topic. Um, I think our our offices and the the other two offices that we mentioned that we work with are pretty up to speed and savvy on this stuff. Um, but it is challenging in the environment that we work in. You know, it's a lot of older people, a lot of people who maybe didn't grow up with this kind of technology, and now all of a sudden here we are in this new world and need to kind of get out ahead of it um, rather than falling behind. So a big part of our working group and our legislation is also kind of talking to other members and other offices and making sure that folks are, are up to speed um, with what we're working on. So, Yeah, I mean, I agree. My boss is pretty savvy about this. Um, I think it's it was sort of due to her when it started, although I wasn't there then, so I suppose I can't really speak for her, but I mean, I think she's gotten pretty up to speed at it, and I think our four offices are generally probably in the know more than some other folks, and they're more interested than some other folks. Um, yeah, sorry, I had a thought, and I sort of just lost the thought. I mean, for me, <laughs> I think it is sort of tough when it, yeah, I mean, I've been doing this for a long time, but like a lot of it is almost engineering talk, you know? So one time she asked me like, what does outgoing only voice over IP mean? And I was kind of like, oh, I need to go back and look that up and I'll get back to you, you know? So um, it is hard because there's a lot of technical concepts. And for me, I'm a lawyer, I'm not an engineer. So, um, you know, there's a lot of things you sort of need to explain in layman's terms. And I think we'd have to do that with anybody, not just our boss. I mean, probably anybody that we meet with or talk to, we'd probably have to do the same thing just to make it make sense for non-techie telecom types. I think we have about one minute. Does anyone have questions in the audience? Tom. <laughs> so uh, a few years ago, we had something called the Digital Government Strategy, which is a strategy mm -hmm. for the federal government for mobility, basically. Do we need a federal strategy for big data? Do we need a federal strategy mm -hmm. for IoT? Can we put that in a bill? Because it, it, it definitely helped mobility move along. I don't know if the House is off BlackBerry yet, but most agencies <laughs> have gotten off BlackBerry. And it was very constructive because then you had Department of Justice talking to mm -hmm. Marty's team at NSA, and you had this big galvanizing effort. We don't have that right now. We've got it for cloud. We've got it for mobility. We don't have it for IoT and big data. Do you want to talk about that? Um, we, we actually 100% agree on the strategy. We introduced a resolution that passed the Senate unanimously last year calling for a national strategy around IoT um, to do exactly that, to make sure that we're kind of out front and uh, that regulation isn't sort of falling behind and trying to catch up long after the fact. The, and Jamie talks about this a lot, that the last thing that we want is for companies to come out with these amazing new innovations and then get caught up in reg rules and regulations that they never saw coming. Um, so we definitely are on board with the national strategy and, and have been working on that. Although if you're, are you sort of asking about government as a user though, more government than sort of consumer? Side, yeah, I mean, I think it's something that sort of needs to be considered, right? Um, I mean, it's kind of hard. You, you sort of see that not every agency is sort of standardized. I will say that at my old agency, when they got VPN, it was like a huge deal. Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess it's probably worth sort of that conversation with GSA and thinking further about like what needs to be done. I mean, we see it with technology generally with what they're doing. I mean, it's hard to sort of even get all the agencies that like manage spectrum on the same page. So, you know, I think it's probably worth a consideration if we want to think about how the government is going to use IoT down the line. Yeah, they need to figure out sort of how to be a little more um, uniform and efficient about those things. So I think we have to wrap it up, but before I let you guys go, can we just do a really quick lightning round and you tell me what you think the most exciting part of the Internet of Things is? Maybe it's not around today, maybe it's something a few years down the line, but what do you think is the most exciting vision for the Internet of Things? I go first. Um, so I'm a big proponent of telehealth and you know remote patient monitoring. Um, my boss represents a pretty much rural state. You know we've got Omaha, we've got Lincoln, the rest of it is rural. So I think that you know to help 
folks that are in rural areas for, you know, in particular access healthcare and sort of make things more efficient for them and make things um, easier to bring to them, I think is really great. I mean, we're seeing a lot of it now, but uh, you know, I've met with some companies from back in Nebraska and they're doing just great stuff to sort of advance connectivity in that space. So I think that's big for me. Yeah, I think it's really fun and great that we're able to do things with the Internet of Things like track our footsteps, but what's most exciting to me is kind of the bigger picture of how this technology can literally help save lives. Um, my boss, my office, were really into UAS and drones, and I mean, just thinking about what that can do for search and rescue and, um, and that whole area, or when we talk about, you know, everybody uses the example of smart refrigerator, well, I think taking that to the next level where it's not just like a consumer convenience, but what can this do for say people with disabilities or people who kind of could rely on these new technologies to really enhance you know, their day-to-day -day lives? Uh, those are both amazing answers and I think probably I, I agree with those. Uh, I'll go a bit more abstract and say what I think the, the ability to make uh, the, the things that we use every day uh, close the loop with the people who make them so that they get feedback on how we're using them and they can design better things. And so all of the, all of the small changes, the small evolutionary uh, um, improvements in materials that happen almost unnoticeably, all of that stuff is gonna happen faster and so we'll have better products uh, faster because manufacturers will know what they're getting wrong much, much faster. I'd also like to take a moment to thank um, Amazon Web Services and Intel uh, for supporting this event this evening. Without them, we would not be able to um, host them, so we're really pleased that they've done that for us tonight. And they'd like to continue the conversation um, at their summit. Um, they have AWS as a public sector summit on June 20th and 21st, so please look out for information about that and continue the conversation tonight here.